Those are exciting times. <laughs> a BBF baby? BBFB. Yes, I'm sure there's, uh, if they did RFCs, April 1st RFCs, there's one in there for them. Yeah. That's cute. Is it just me or is this from smaller than what we usually get, huh? Yeah, they've been, I mean, in the past, they had always, always like, either too small or too big rooms. Um, yeah. I don't know what, I mean, I think Diego had some struggle with the Secretariat. I don't know who's to blame. <laughs> Well, they only gave them one session this time, too, and usually we have two. Yeah, but this time, I, I also heard it, it's really tight. You know, with rooms and, uh, so. That's why? I don't know. Uh, I did open, uh, or I did tell the tools guy, uh, hey, this is the experience you and I were having where... Oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. 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 Yeah, I think they are doing some updates, so some things didn't work this week, but I think they're happy for you to Actually, we can offer the, the clicker. Are you sure it works with your... Uh... Mm -hmm. I'm doing that right now as well, yeah. で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、
last one in the folder, remember? Hmm. I think. I think we can close this one. Oops, oh, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> hey, while we're waiting, can we get the blue sheet started? Um, you, sir. Yes, would you like to come get one? Thank you. Hey, Heather, do you want to come on up and sure. I'll get you to pass this out on your, I know you know this. Darn All right. It. Thank you. Oh, no, no, there's a pen on there. Okay, sorry for the glitch. Um, thanks for coming. Um, we are not Diego and Ramki, um, so they both couldn't make it uh, this week. Um, so Sarah and I are, are standing in. Um, so it's a pleasure for us. Um, let, let's get started. So you are uh, hopefully aware of the um, IRTF IPR policy. Um, so this applies to this meeting um, as well. So essentially that says um, if you are aware of uh, any IPR of things that are presented here or that you are presenting or that are discussed here, you are expected to notify us um, in a really timely manner. Um, so the chairs asked us to uh, you know, pass this request on to you. Um, so please continue reviewing all the documents. Um, so it's um, like really essential to um, establish a good, a good quality. Um, so we, so the group gets many, you know, submissions, many contributions. So that's uh, essentially great. Um, but so if you want to have your documents reviewed, uh, maybe you can also, you know, uh, help the others. And um, Please also, kind of note, this is not only like a presentation only um, activity, right? So, um, I mean, we expect you to have like um, make progress on research questions, have active discussions on the main list. So, please also use these tools. Um, slides are all in the data tracker. Um, there's a main list uh, website wiki at the usual uh, locations. So before we get started, we have to um, sort out two important things. Um, first is note taker. Um, that's really important, as you know. And so normally Sarah and I are doing that. Um, so today we're unfortunately <laughs> a bit challenged. <laughs> Could we get some volunteers for note takers? I could bribe you with a beer. Yes, I've learned from the best. Saki? Ah, oh, winner. Yes, yes, perfect. Yes, right. You we have one. Could we get a backup note taker? I'm serious about the beer. Sold to you in the back, sir. What's your name? Uh, yeah. Oh, and at first, a new attendee. Awesome. Thank you. So um, f uh, please, when you're done, come up and see me. I'll make sure you have my email address so you can send me the, the minutes when you're done. Oh, I guess yours are on Etherpad, so yours will be live. Um, and then... Folks, remember, when you come up to the microphone, state your name slowly and clearly. We have a new attendee taking notes, which means he doesn't know any of you. So saying your name slowly and your affiliation will really help in the minute. Thank you. So regarding note taking, I'm not sure if you know. So if you look at the agenda, you find a, a link to an, an Etherpad instance. Um, preferably use that. That's also helpful if someone is missing something, maybe a, n a name, you can just you know help the person and, and fill it up. Um, second thing is um, JavaScript. So we will have at least uh, Diego participating remotely. So we would really appreciate if he could uh, get his comments uh, <laughs> to you. Is, is anyone on, on, on Java? Same beer is on the table. <laughs> Can anybody log into Jabber? I mean, the the. The main job is really to monitor um, the, the channel and relay some questions. All right. All right. So there's no no Java today. Okay. So um, just a quick reminder. Um, so there, there's too much going on in NFV for, um, uh, these days that we, we cannot list all of, of these things. Please use the mail list uh, to announce uh, relevant um, events, call for papers, and so on. Um, please keep this you know, to um, so research like open source kind of activities. Um, avoid sending marketing material. Can you please close the door? Um, 
And so it's my pleasure to uh, congratulate Sarah on your uh, new appointment. So she's going to um, be helping Diego and Dranti with, uh, with the group in the future. That's great. Um, apparently, um, they already uh, rebuilt the, wik the wiki. Um, so um, that's work in progress, I assume. Um, please look at that and provide feedback. And um, so a couple of things that may be relevant to um, the activities uh, in, in this group. So you probably aware that, I mean, there's lots of discussion around network slicing, you know, in 5G use cases and so on. Um, and um, that couple of, of documents um, that have been submitted um, could be good for us to, you know, uh, look at this, um, understand it, and maybe also, you know, build some idea, some research agenda, perhaps, what, what could be done. Um, so that was the um, suggestion by, by, by Diego and Ranki. Um, so fi let's figure out um, what NFVRG um, can do in this context. So there's a site meeting um, uh, later tonight uh, in Studio 3, um, so on 5G slicing. Um, I, I guess some, some of us could be interested. Um, so for this meeting, um, so as usual, we have a pretty packed agenda. Um, so in order to get, like, give everyone a fair chance to present their material, we have to be a bit strict on, on the time management. So um, we will uh, really keep the time and, and stick to it. And we will, at some point, have to kick you off the stage. So uh, we'll give you a two minutes warning, though. <laughs> um, so um, please try to, to, to manage that. So we have, I mean, seen the material, um, some of you have really many, many slides. Um, seems like it could be really challenging. Please try to figure out how, how to manage that uh, yourself. Um, and that brings us uh, to the agenda. Um, so there's one uh, change we applied um, compared to the posted agenda. So we're taking the OpenFV update um, first, so Heather has an uh, important conflict and, and has to leave pretty soon. And we'll talk then about first about our um, group uh, drafts and uh, updates on proposed drafts, and then a say uh, and, and reports on various um, research and open source uh, activities. And if there's any time left, um, so if you have any other announcement to make, uh, we can use that for that. All right, is there any question, comment, and ah. JavaScript? Any bash of the agenda? Moving right along. All right. No. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Heather to the stage. Ooh. Do you want to use this? Pink box. All right, the last, last one of these I had trouble with. All right, um, so, hey, I have a flight to catch, so I am going to uh, probably try to do this in a fairly um, quick fashion. But so, um, hi, I'm Heather Kirksey. Uh, I head up uh, the OPNFE project. Um, I've come to talk to the NFVRG a couple times with updates um, on the project. Um, so thanks for letting me come back again. Um, so just as a reminder, OPNFV is the open source project that works on um, NFV, and uh, we do that through um, system uh, level integration, testing, and working with upstream projects to integrate new features and capabilities relevant for um, NFV use cases. Um, I've shown this diagram before, but basically sort of, um, you know, so where we, we build a stack um, uh, or sort of a series of stacks uh, as a platform, um, drawing from uh, various other uh, pieces of work going on upstream. Um, and then we do uh, testing, deployment, uh, integration, um, and um, documentation and new feature work around that. So just reminding everybody, the bulk of this uh, presentation is about sort of our most recent release, Colorado, what we've done um, there, what might be relevant for y'all. So in terms of our current stack, um, this is what our Colorado stack looks like. Um, new things are that uh, we have, uh, you can see that we have got uh, FDIO um, in there, which we did not before. So we've uh, done some initial work with VPP um, integration. Um, and then also um, we continue to sort of support the three um, open source uh, main 
uh, open source SDN controllers. Um, and yeah, and so sort of in terms of the things that we uh, did in this release, um, not much has necessarily changed in terms of the integration testing and features, um, sort of a continuation of a lot of the projects from our Brahmaputra release. So. What's, what's new? Um, first thing up uh, that I think you might hear about are uh, service function chaining uh, improvements. So our last release, we had very initial uh, service function chain capabilities. Um, this time we uh, introduced multiple node support, uh, failover and load balancing, dynamic service chain modifications. We also do support um, NSH. Um, at this juncture, and um, we basically were able to incorporate a, a Open Daylight uh, Boron, um, which is their most recent release, and came out about three days before ours did. Um, and so they've been working really hard to get a lot more features um, around the service function chaining, and we were able to do a lot of end-to-end um, -end testing of those. Um, so we are able to actually uh, compose the platform. Uh, use attacker from OpenStack to install some actual VNFs, set up service various service chains amongst those VNFs, and uh, validate that they work. Um, we improved our uh, IPv6 support. So Brahmaputra, we did some initial v6. So this is very exciting. Um, uh, and uh, we were able to basically add in the ability to test uh, v6-only scenarios um, this time. Uh, we've got full overlay and underlay support within IPv6, and additional installers can support uh, v6 installation. Um, we, over the course of the past two releases, um, Open Daylight, uh, the Linux kernel, and OpenStack all sort of considerably improve their v6 support that you know, sort of enables us to be able to do this. Um, our SDN VPN project also um, sort of lots of uh, enhancements since last time. Uh, I've got last time we had some basic layer three of VPN support. This time we've got full layer two, layer three support. Um, we do have um, uh, implemented a BGP um, uh, peering, and we've got uh, integration. Uh, we added also integration with the uh, B Quagga BGP uh, router. Um, another thing is, as I mentioned before, initial VPP integration and support through what color fast data sacks project. Um, a lot of updates on security. So uh, we actually achieved the core infrastructure initiative badge at this time, which is a Linux Foundation project that focuses on security projects. Um, and they've come up with a set of best practices for open source projects. Um, so uh, we attained that badge and we actually kind of through our scanning and work we're able to get, uh, we actually found, I think, about 12 to 15 security re specific related patches that we actually updated heading into the release. And we got to exercise our uh, security vulnerability um, escalation and management and reporting process for the first time, uh, two days before the release. So that was exciting. Uh, we do now support sort of a multi-hardware architecture support. So we fully support ARM as well as x86. And we have got some um, ARM test labs in our Pharos Federated Community Test Lab. A project, and we, um, as we always do, we focus on sort of you know adding in more tests, automating more tests, um, and getting the the DevOps um, CI/CD processes uh, um, you know even better. So that's always one of the things that we do. Um, so in terms of things that are next, we are hosting our second plug fest um, at UNH IOL um, in December. Um, some of the focus areas that we're really looking to focus from an interop perspective there are around sort of you know hardware and any. NFVI um, interoperability, um, VNF uh, interoperability on sort of different NFVI implementations and SDN controller um, interop. Our next release will be called Danube. Uh, it's coming in March. Um, and this will be the first time we're going to really probably have some MANO support. So we, we are working um, right now with um, OpenO and OpenBaton on the MANO side. We've also got some other projects uh, going on around VNF event stream uh, modeling. Um, so we're actually going to start testing using some of the standard um, NetConf and Yang and Tosca models out there, um, actually trying to onboard and provision a VNFs using some standard models. Um, and uh, uh, just you know, continuing sort of the feature improvement that we had in uh, Colorado. One of the kind of the themes of the Colorado release was it was sort of more incremental improvements. Um, you know, in terms of the software that we did, we sort of the features that we'd introduced in Brahma Future, we just made them work um, better, and uh, we'll kind of continue uh, on with that. And um, one of the other things that we're sort of looking at that's you know maybe a little bit more dev centric. Um, 
is uh, really looking to, we're beginning to think about how we can integrate our tool chains with some of those other upstream projects so that we can, you know, automate all of the integration and testing and stuff um, even further and get sort of bug information to upstream developers uh, more, even more quickly. So, um, and then, so that's kind of the update on Colorado. And then kind of just finally my sort of just final question is I, you know, love to hear how folks think that sort of OPNFE as well as the other Linux Foundation networking projects, you know, we've got a lot of them, you know, right now. Um, how can we continue to collaborate and build, you know, good relationships and bridges, you know, with the IRTF and the IETF? Um, you know, we, we work and we, you know, we're, we're implementing a lot of the sort of standards um, that y'all are working on here. Um, and, you know, I do personally, you know, think that that sort of, you know, working together hand in hand with open source and, and standards is, you know, one of the important things as we transform the networking industry. So if you have any ideas or thoughts here, uh, always feel free to reach out to me. Um, and if there are other touch points, you know, we're looking at maybe some, uh, you know, maybe Hackfest collaboration and things like that. But, you know, I really want to see our, you know, basically our communities have a great relationship. Okay, cool. Thanks, Heather. Any quick questions? Okay, thank you very much uh, for the flight. So OpenFV is um, yeah, probably one of the um, say most relevant projects uh, to this group. So um, I think it's really um, also useful as an experimentation platform. So please uh, check that out. Um, let's let's continue. Um, so um, next is the, an update of the um, policy-based resource management draft. And you have the floor. Ah. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, this draft is about policy-based resource management. Uh, I am in Sanjiang and PhD student in Korea University. Uh, I have been working as one of the contributors for the this draft. Uh, instead of authors Robert Singik, uh, I talk about the update of this draft today because they cannot attend this uh, this ITF. But there are changes in version two. Uh, we have at this section 5.10, which did describe our operational policies for resource management that NFWM and Vim and Vim. Uh, we have have added new sections, for example, so policy-based went forwarding graph management and policy-based fault management. Uh, these are operational policies for resource management. Uh, first version, we define the operational policy in section 5.1, uh, which which supports uh, business logic realized by domain ownership. Uh, so we specify these operational policies need, need for resource management. Uh, these the operational policies uh, can split to different layers of NFW and Beam. Uh, the, uh, regarding operational policy at NFWO, we include authentication, authorization, accounting to pay policy, uh, providing ways of identifying resource requests, allowing it access to NFPA resources and measuring con the consumed resource uses. Also, we resource adaptation ID policy, uh, support how NFPA adapts the allocated NFPA resources uh, for handling dynamic changes, such as uh, varying stats or failure in NFPA one resources. Resource scheduling RS policy provides uh, how the resources are allocated to VNF and VR instance network service across uh, paths under multiple beams and ones. Uh, regarding operational policies at Vim and Vim, we include resource allocation RA policy and resource embedding RA policy. RA policy supports how <coughs> how each subsystem such as uh, compute or or storage subsystem resources. Uh, is uh, allocated based on the, the allocation information coming from NFBO. A resource embedding RA policy determines how the allocated virtual resources are associated with uh, physical resources regarding virtualization solutions. Uh, we are, in addition, we have included a uh, new example of policy based VN folding graph management and force management. Uh, for describing this example, 
uh, we ref refer to contents provided in reference uh, the reference management service chain by Swing Lee as one of, of the, the, the emerging draft. Uh, this example describes a uh, brand forwarding graph placement policy regarding RS policy, in particular by considering features of brand forwarding graph and recovery policies regarding RD policy for a failed VNF, VNF in a brand forwarding graph. But we need to discuss this example more details as a next step. Regarding status, we still have no change with content structure, some same definitions, scope, and contents coming from three adaptive drafts. Uh, but we need more discussions about the scope of these drafts. Uh, regarding next steps, we still, uh, these are still missing. So we need to review and update to draft the scope, goal, and structure based on the three adaptive draft. Uh, also, we would like to include the relations to a service function chain in control plane and identify gaps with the service function chaining. Also, we we need to cl clarify differences between uh, resource and capability management uh, mentioned the last time. These are authors of three adaptive draft. That's all for my presentation. Okay, thank you, Isun. Do people have comments, questions? Um, can, I, can I just ask, I mean, who has um, actually read this update? Okay, so that's not overwhelmingly many people. Um, so we need to work on that, I think. Um, so if we uh, adopt um, documents uh, for the for like as uh, group documents, I mean that means we want to evolve them together also, right? And so the the authors really also need your feedback. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. So Carlos is next. Right? So next is um, NFVRG gaps for network virtualization. And Carlos is presenting. Okay, I'm Carlos Bonaros presenting an update of uh, the, drafts on, the draft on uh, uh, network virtualization research challenges. So just a brief recap of uh, the history of the draft. We initially presented in Prague and then was adopted after Yokohama. And since then we have done uh, couple of iterations. Well, actually, we did one in first presented in Buenos Aires, the first uh, research group uh, document. Then we did uh, an update in Berlin. And since then, we have done a couple of uh, updates that are the ones that I'm going to just uh, present next. So first, in terms of the goals of the document, well, the goals, the main goal is to identify and describe some challenges, again, uh, around the network virtualization area. And those have been based on, on an analysis of different gaps that uh, are existing today based on, the, on surveying different efforts. And um, we have recently changed the title of the document just to reflect better this goal. Before it was called Gap Analysis and Network Virtualization Activities, but now we rename it to Network Virtualization Research Challenges. So basically focusing or highlighting this uh, main goal of the document. Then in this next uh, in this latest revisions of the document, we have mapped these research challenges to the net, uh, near term work items of the research group. And we are also providing a mapping or to how or where these research challenges may be tackled inside ITF, IRTF in terms of working group research groups. The document structure, the current document structure is the following. The first part has not been modify even significantly since the, the version 01. It's basically introduction, terminology, and the background where we just uh, summarize main technology related to network virtualization. And then we go into the actual challenges and some uh, conclusions out of, out of those. And this has been uh, improved and uh, updated, the, both the structure and the content in the last two revisions of the document. We basically group some of the challenges in, in bigger topics and we introduce new ones based on the on the feedback uh, gathered on the middle list. We receive quite a lot of input for these this, uh, new two iterations of the document. And in addition to that, we also 
have a first section on, on the mapping to the working groups where there may be work to be done addressing these challenges, and one new section on the mapping of these challenges to the uh, near-term work uh, items of the group. So it's just, uh, we believe that this will make the document more valuable because it will be clearly mapped these challenges towards the work that the, the research group is actually looking at. So here is just a bit more details on what I just uh, summarized. The, the changes in 01, so the ones that we have done in 02 and 03, has been adding these new challenges, these sections on virtualization technologies, metrics for NFV characterization, improving usage, and user device virtualization, and some other stuff. Uh, well, some uh, most of this has been thanks to the input provided by, by you guys on the main list, special thanks to Nicolas Khan and uh, Senua Dixit for the, the text that they contributed to 02 and 03. And we actually have uh, ready text from Pierre Lins and uh, Pedro Martinez Julia on, on some additional stuff that couldn't make it to the to the 03 because of the cutoff deadline, but uh, we will actually introduce this text in 04 version, probably this week or next week. Just a, some few works on this summary section, which I believe are very important for the value of uh, to the research group. The first one mapping the research areas that we have uh, on the on the left hand side here to the potential home at ITF IRTF where those challenges may be addressed. This was already there in the in the zero one version. We have just improved and updated it. And then the new the new section that is summarizing or basically categorizing the the challenges that we identify in the document and put it there or doing a mapping with the near term work items in the in the group. So we believe this is also very useful because that can be used for the research group to actually identify which areas have more gaps or more research challenges to be to be tackled. So that's a quick update on, on, on this, what we did. So next steps, as I mentioned, to, to come up with an update 04 version, including the additional contributions that we have received, the one from PLX on testing and the one from uh, Pedro on uh, IoT and uh, mobile operator virtualization. We have also received some uh, hints from Diego on how to uh, add stuff on uh, remote attestation from, for another document done in uh, I2NSF. So we include all these uh, contributions in the next revision. Uh, so uh, usual, if you have any additional comments, please uh, provide that. We will be happy to, to get that into account and to introduce that uh, into, the, into the next revision. And at this stage, we believe that the document is uh, quite uh, mature. We believe that it's useful for the, for the community at large because we survey different challenges and we try also to identify what those may be tackled. So we would like to get your opinion on, on, on the possibility of starting a, a research group uh, last call after the next iteration, the next cycle of, uh, of the document. And that's it from, from this. We, ha we have a Jabber scribe, so ah, thank you. Fantastic. Uh, yes, so uh, from Jabber room, from Diego Lopez, he says, uh, maybe network slicing is a term associated with a particular environment. I'm thinking that a more gen general term regarding resource or function sharing would be more adequate in the RG context. That's his comment. Okay, I agree that the network slicing term is heavily overloaded. So I agree that we may need to take a look at the current test and try to be more specific with that terminology because I yeah. agree it's Mm. Used for almost everything slicing now, nowadays. Right. Do people have other comments or questions? How many folks have read the draft? Okay, a few. Um, okay, so we won't make any determination regarding um, like adoption now. So you're going to do this next revision anyway. So then, would you like to um, ask for that in, in Chicago for the next ITF? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, how happy are you with the feedback you are getting right now? I mean, you, you got some, some input. Quite, actually, quite happy because uh, we, were, we got uh, quite a lot of input, actually, text, real text that we just added. Hmm. We actually have uh, three contributions pending to be, to be added. So, and so far, people was supportive and was actually contributing with text. So, I'm, 
I'm quite happy at this point. Okay, uh, great. Thanks for doing that work. And thank, thank you, you can stay there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and if we might come to me. Okay, so again, uh, Carlos, I'm, I'm presenting this on behalf of uh, my co authors. This is an update of a draft that we initially. Well, we presented in Buenos Aires, I guess, first uh, version. I don't remember, but for sure we presented in, in Berlin. It's about multi-domain uh, network virtualization, multi-domain multi NFV. So the rationale of uh, this document is that, uh, well, NFV has not been really fully addressed in, in scenarios involving more than one uh, domain, one administrative or technological domain. And we have here some examples, for example, from a point of view of a pure infrastructure a scenario, we may want to use uh, resources, network, computer, and storage from different administrative domains, and this is not really fully tackled. And we can go into more complex scenarios in which we don't only talk about resources, but we also talk about uh, network functions, network services intensity in different administrative domains. So the goal is to actually allow this programmability flexibility involving multiple multiple domains and that's going to the into the final goal of uh, significantly reducing the the time required to deploy a service when invoking different administrative domains or when involving multiple administrative domains so this is the nfv reference architecture sorry uh, i guess you are all familiar with this so i will not spend more time just to basically highlight that in this reference architecture multi-domain was not really fully present in the original HCNV architecture, although it's something that has been tackled, as we will see later in, a, in, a, in the next slide. So the problem statement, well, we want to, we, we know that the, there are situations in which we have available resources at different uh, administrative domains, and we want to actually be able to, to use those in an end-to-end -end service. But those mechanisms required to do so are not yet there. So we need to standardize the mechanisms in order to be able to do so. So a solution is needed for dealing with multi, both multi-domain and multi-operator, multi-provider uh, resource orchestration, or actually orchestration in general. And we differentiate here multi-operator and multi-domain because even in a single provider, single administrative uh, domain scenario, we may have multiple domains, multiple technological domains that we need to also uh, make sure that we can orchestrate or uh, put resources together in, into a given solution. So both things are, are required. So trying to provide an overview of some of the solutions that are being discussed right now in NetCNV in terms of uh, multi-domain orchestration, this is one example that is that was described in the document uh, from the NFV IFA that was published in July. And this is a first approach in which we basically split the NFVO into two different functionalities, the network service orchestration and the resource orchestration, the NSO and the RO. And we may have, for example, two different domains in which each of these domains provides some resources that can be used for others to deploy a service. So we have uh, RO basically de dealing with the, the management of the resources, and then we have an NSO on top that is able to uh, manage the, the life cycle of the network service by using resources from more, more than one administrative domain. This is one approach that is being proposed there as an architectural possible approach. Another one is this one in which we don't split the NFVO functionality. So we have the whole typical NFVO functions at the different domains, and then we have a, an umbrella on top that is basically managing the life cycle of the services interacting with NFO, NFVOs of the different administrative domains. So another approach that is being considered there. So what we document in the in the draft is basically the approach that we are following at uh, an, a 5GX European project that is basically specifically looking into multi-domain orchestration. We presented this figure in, in Berlin, so we follow up on this uh, split of NSO and RO functionality. I will not go into the details because we already presented this and I'm gonna I want to present some additional stuff that we added in the document in the last revision so basically before going into the our architecture uh, in in this 5gx project just to to make or to highlight the difference between multi-domain orchestration and single domain orchestration in a single domain of course the orchestration orchestrator is aware of the entire domain resources and has control over those 
while in the multi-domain, we first need to be aware of the resources and the functions that are available at the different domains. So we need that kind of uh, dialogue, that kind of exchange, and then we need also to be able to exercise control over those. And that exchange of information and control needs to be standardized. And this is basically the main goal of this 5GX project that uh, we are basically contributing with this solution. So what is the main high-level architecture that we are pro considering at this point that we want to present and is documented into the draft? So basically, we have this multi-provider orchestrator that is interacting with uh, other multi-provider orchestrators sitting in other domains, in other uh, administrative domains, other providers. And we consider three main interfaces of this multi-provider orchestrator. One that we call interface one, that is basically talking to the customer, to the tenant, so it's the one that is actually trying to deploy an end-to-end -end service over multiple domains. Then we have another one that is basically talking or enabling the dialogue, dialogue between different multi-provider orchestration orchestrators, which is uh, interface two, that uh, is for getting information about what the others can provide and then also to exercise the control of, of and the instantiation of those uh, services on, on the other domains. And then we have interface three, which is the one actually interacting with the different resources that we have in the provider, the different domains that we may have with the different domain orchestrators. orchestrators. And if we just take a look into, okay, this multi-provider orchestrator, what are the main functions that we need to actually implement? We have identified three main blocks at this point. One is the catalog in, in the sense of uh, getting information about what are the resources, the functions that are available at different domains. And based on that, we can also offer uh, what we can provide to other domains over interface two and interface one. We have also the topology management. We need to know about the topology of the resources in order to be able to then instantiate those resources, those uh, functions on, on top of those resources. Then we have, of course, the orchestration functionality, the typical NFBO functionality in terms of getting a request to deploy a service. And we need to decide in which domain we need to instantiate with function. And that's basically based on the, in the information that we got on interface two. And then we will actually control instantiate services functions on the domains under the control of this NFBO and on other domains over interface, interface two. And the last part is the assurance management. Once we have deployed a service, we need to ensure that this service is fulfilling, meeting the SLAs that we may have in place. And for that, we need to monitor first the, the, the use of the resources and how the service is behaving and report on, on that over interface one to the to the customer. So this is very high level picture of uh, what we consider an architecture required to deal with multi-domain orchestration. So this is basically what is described in the draft at this, at this point and what are the, our next steps? So, well, we, are con we continue evolving this architecture definition and we want to actually fully specify these three main interfaces, interface one, two, and three, where well, we, we are trying to identify what is the best place to standardize those interfaces. Of course, HCNFV is uh, one key uh, potential home for, for some of this. Then we are also implementing, as we speak, this architecture, and we are introducing the functions and, and validating and assessing the performance of this uh, architecture in, in the 5GX project, and we will release part, if not all, of this as uh, open source. So we will actually announce that when, when ready. And we are also experiment, experimenting how this behaves on, on a distributed testbed across the across Europe with uh, different, uh, different sites. We are, of course, looking for feedback from the group. And, uh, and that's it from my side. Do you have any questions or comments on this? Can you use the mic? I'm Flink from Nokia. I'm, I'm curious about this topology mani management. Can, can you, which topology it is managing? It's topology of the resources. You need to know, I mean, from the point of view of connectivity, you need to know how the different domains are connected. Of course, the, the, the way these topologies uh, actually advertise depends on, on, on the relationship you may have of the different domains. At the first, you provide a very high level uh, uh, vision of the topology and then you may get into bilateral negotiation and then you can provide a more detailed view 
depending on, on, on the relationship with the different domains of those resources. But this is the topology for the connection, but also the the actual resources that you may have in terms of compute and storage. So VMs that you can provide, this kind of thing. So it's topology of the of the resources in general. And the topology information is exchanged over this interface too. Uh, yeah. Have you considered already which protocol you are? Going we are actually now looking into that. So for example, for the initial part of the very generic uh, topology information exchange, we are using BGPLS with some extensions that we are developing, but we are considering other candidates. And this is for the initial. Then for the detailed exchange, we may go for a ad hoc protocol or we can also extend BGPLS. This is being discussed at this point. Thank you. Parvizigani, uh, Huawei. Sorry, I wasn't at the last IETF meeting. Could you go back to page 10? Yeah, page 10. Page 10. Yeah. Um, is this inter-service provider scenario or intra-service provider scenario, or both? Both. OK, if it's both, then the catalog belongs to which provider? Because you have one catalog shown. You have you have one catalog per provider. I mean, this we are. I'm just showing here the zoom of the components here, but you will have the same thing here as well. Okay. So and then you have the the customer. Of course, the OSS the top yeah, layer. Yeah. So it's there is a reference that we can get the details here. You mean the reference document of of this thing or? Yeah, because this. You call this like an uh, architecture or what? Maybe yeah. I'm yeah, missing yeah. something because I wasn't <laughs> the last meeting. Um, to me, the assurance management, assurance from which perspective, to which operator? To the customer here. OK, so it's the same thing on the right. Yeah. But the point is that uh, the customer may be here, maybe here, depending on, I mean, the customer is facing one of these uh, multi-provider orchestrators. But there may be different customers, and you may have customers here sitting here getting a, a service that also involves resources in this administrative domain. So this sort of management component is basically ensuring that the SLA that you negotiated with the customer here is actually met. I'm, I'm providing the feedback, monitoring results to the customer, and basically taking over interface interface three on the resources own by this domain and over interface two on the resources owned by or managed by, by sorry, by other other uh, domains. And your, your point about the reference, you, you were talking about a reference document where we put details on this or? Yeah, yeah, you, you need to show if this is the top layer, then layer below, you had the split architecture, yeah? Mm -hmm. You're assuming that uh, this is the top NFU, the top layer, and then you still have the SO and NO or RO. You still have those layers, yeah? yeah? Yes. yes, yes, yes. I mean, this is a very high-level view that we put into the draft, but uh, there are some... Uh, actually, we are about to release a public deliverable of the project where we go into really all the details because it's more complex than this. So we have different boxes here. This is NSORO. We have different components here. We have different components here. So as, as soon as it's really published on the web, we, we will also send an email to the mailing list so you can get... Uh, one more question. Details. Yeah, what's the difference between the IF1 and the one that is already defined in Etsy architecture <laughs> framework, like the OSS and the NFEO is already defined? Is there a difference? The OSS? Yeah, there is already a reference defined. There can <laughs> You mean, ah, okay, you mean? Yeah, well, if you go to this one, you know OSMA, MA, <laughs> MA <laughs> on the top? Ah, this one. Yeah, what is the difference between OS-MA and uh, IF1? Is that is this a subset of the IF1 or is it a superset or what? This is something that we, I mean, uh, we are still looking at that, but as far as I no, I'm not, uh, probably I don't know all the details of this, but uh, here we, you don't have this kind of catalog information about what you have in different domains on this interface, right? You don't have this kind of uh, information there. Because, uh, sorry? Per customer. You need to be, a, thank you. Huh? Okay, so Come to the mic. Maybe people following uh, online, so. Yeah, for online? No, no, use the mic, please. Okay, sorry. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. If you really look at this, you have the customer which has their uh, legacy OSS BSS today, mm -hmm. and then you have the new like Mano stack. The exchange between the legacy uh, system and the Mano stack is already uh, at least that. That was the intention of HC, NFE, ISG, that you have that reference point. I believe that in phase two, um, they're already working on how to get a uh, uh, normative requirement for, for that interface, correct? I guess so. I'm... Okay, so that gives you the scope of IF1. So now you're saying that's part of this work, you're going to include IF1 in the scope of the work, mm -hmm. maybe you can uh, leverage the work that has already been done. Yes, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I mean, for, of course, this interface one, as well as the, the other ones, is they are not meant to be like completely new things. I mean, we are we aim at leverage on existing work as much as possible. So this is not, I mean, something new. Actually, this is a subset of functionality. For example, part of the functionality that we depict here as uh, interface two, as Hanu mentioned is BGPLS, just one example, and there are other functionality. So we aim at leverage on existing stuff. And for interface one, of course, if there is something already, I mean, we are in the process of evaluating what is there, what that provides, and what is missing. And we, if there are something missing, we will propose uh, a solution, but if not, we will just leverage on what is, what is there. So we are not trying to in, introduce a new interface thing if it's already there. I don't know if you see my... Well, I'm um, mentioning any solution is premature in my mind, like BGPLS. You cannot just randomly bring up a protocol and say, this is a good candidate. You need to justify that. Okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, this is... I just reporting on the stuff that we are considering evaluating, but this is not the final decision. And of course, we are in the process of... Uh, when we take a decision, we will justify why. Yeah, for sure. I'm just a physical representation of the remote queue. I get to press the button. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's try it. Diego, can you talk? Yes. Hopefully you should uh, be even see me, I guess. I don't know. Hello. Um, this is Diego Lopez from uh, uh, talking from Spain. Uh, no, th th there is a w w one thing is uh, regarding what uh, Parvis was commenting. I don't think that I have one matches well with the OS, OSMA uh, interface, mostly because the OSM, OS, OSMA interface is, uh, is um, intended precisely to support legacy operators OSS. And my understanding here is that the IF1 here is uh, uh, dealing with the tenant. That, that implies dealing with the, with the user of the, um, of the customer, of the operator. So it, the, the tenant is making requests, right, uh, Carlos? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, and, and second, second, looking at it, I don't know. I don't know your plans, and I'm and thinking about our our uh, docu the document publication, etc. Since this is very much related to uh, precisely resource management, because the um, um, the, the multi-domain scenario, in my view, has to. I mean, this multi-domain scenario has to has to do a lot with uh, resource sharing. Precisely, I was wondering whether some of what you have been you are discussing here could go precisely to the draft that was presented uh, to uh, in the two slots before of of this one by um, uh, Jiang, if I remember what he, his name. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. No, no, go ahead. No, 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 go, go for it. Go for it. I have. Uh, I, I think. No, I think I think that's a, a a good proposal. We can we can discuss with uh, the guys of the other draft. I I fully agree that this in line with that that view of uh, resource orchestration. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you 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 have a very good point of contact because Robert is among the authors of this, and Robert is one of the editors of the other documents. So <laughs> it's a, it would would be part of a self discussion. The, the, simply that. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Diego. And thanks, Carlos. Uh, so we're looking forward to the implementation and experimentation results. Yeah. Great work. Thanks. I get to hit the button again. Okay. All right. Um, moving on.
Ähm, so next is, um, let me pronounce the name correctly, <laughs> or maybe leave, but then you do it. <laughs> I'm sorry. So network coding and uh, anything. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Angeles Vázquez Castro. <laughs> so I had to change also the name of the draft because it was too long. So NetCode stands for Network Coding. So please. Um, you can use the clicker if, we, if you find it. Ah, OK. OK, so um, this draft is uh, a bit different because it's still in the, uh, it's a bit conceptual. And uh, I am still uh, in the process of matching co concepts. So that's why I explain why this draft first, then why this draft here, and then what are the objectives of the draft, and then uh, the structure of the draft, so to say your reading. And then what I see can be uh, still done, and then uh, that I would like to know your feedback from. So why this draft? Okay, so um, this is because the novel concept of network coding uh, can be seen as a network function, CF. And um, this has some operative uh, advantages. So, um, However, this uh, network function is not a traditionally implemented network function in dedicated hardware, which is what you are used to call a network function. Um, but you may uh, be aware of uh, the coding, uh, what the coding uh, function, classic coding does, which helps it to provide quality of service, uh, trading delay and throughput. So this is uh, something like that, but the generalization of that. So this uh, will be helpful for, for this framework. This is because the, uh, this network con coding concept enables in network optimized re-encoding, so we can access uh, the, the packets in, in network and re-encode. And this is proved to provide throughput gains and network control degrees of reliability. So we, we have much more control on the reliability uh, throughout the network, especially. So then why this draft here? Because um, as coding, I could just go to quality of service and so on. But um, the, the point is that if uh, we think of network coding as a, as a network function, it happens that the virtualization of such function has also operative advantages. Why? Because such function uh, relies on having access to networking, computation, and storage resources throughout the network. So our function does need all this to perform. Then um, it also uh, can uh, work uh, much better if it has access to network statistics analytics. And uh, then it is also uh, so, uh, al almost straightforward that uh, this network coding function can be integrated into the network function virtualization framework and as a possibility for architectural uh, function design solution. And by doing so, we have access to all what we need for operating this, this uh, tool, if you want. So this is why I first presented a very high level idea at the uh, meeting in Berlin and I was asked to have a draft so uh, it's easy to get your feedback. So the objectives of this very high level draft is first to show that network coding can be designed as a network function. We, uh, what we do is to identify the modules and the objective too is to show how this uh, such network coding function um, uh, requirements of connectivity, computation and storage resources find a natural framework in this uh, network coding function virtual architectural framework. But of course, we have to understand it from network coding perspective, meaning that people ha who have uh, developed this architecture, they didn't have in, in their minds network coding at all because it didn't exist, let's say, or it existed only theoretically in the very, very uh, theoretical research area, but that is coming here, it's slowly coming here. So if we understand uh, all your work from this new perspective, it can be matched. That's the, that's the, the message. 
So this is just uh, the, st the structure of the draft. So these are my co-authors. We have two, we are two academics and two developers because we have all this, uh, this, um, this um, uh, funded pro research projects. You can see here um, European funded projects from two from European Space Agency and one from European Global Navigation Settlement System Agency. So um, we are, uh, the others are developers. So we are matching concepts and, and reality, and so far, so good. Um, that's why I'm here. And so then the structure, as you can see, has this, uh, first of all, what, what the network coding is as a network function, and then what, uh, how we um, virtualize net, the network coding function. So the, the and one of the key things here is the virtualization of flows, which is um, something uh, a novelty uh, bring that brings uh, this uh, perspective. So um, I will just uh, look at it. So for in, in section three, I, uh, we um, explain network coding as a network function, and in doing so, we we we, we make clear that network coding is a broad concept, so it involves not only what we are presenting here, but it involves three design domains, different domains. It has the coding domain, and this is mathematics pure pure mathematics and algebra, and then it has the functional domain um, that uh, uh, is uh, the set of functional properties that uh, makes use of this uh, of these codes, and then of course the protocol domain to make uh, it all uh, work. So um, I don't bring here the coding domain or the protocol domain. Uh, it uh, I bring here the functional domain, but you have to make it to to um, keep in mind that there is these two domains too. And then the way we make it uh, as, as a function is to identify uh, um, tool, a toolbox of functionalities. So these three toolboxes, uh, like the coding, re-encoding, and decoding functionalities, RDF, because of course, the, the functionality makes use of the coding, but this doesn't mean that uh, the, the user should know what code is about. It's the same as in classic coding. Uh, the, the, the protocol um, designer uh, just need to know how the code works, doesn't need to know the algebra uh, behind. So here is the same. And then flow engineering functionalities, because with all this, uh, what all this, what you are, uh, are able to do is provide quality of service by uh, engineering your flows. And then of course, the, the interaction with the physical abstraction functionalities, which one option is the virtual framework, virtualized framework. So the, just the section four is the straightforward uh, virtualization, which would be our uh, set of functions would be just one of those bo box, well-known boxes. And I just uh, um, highlight here the, this important differentiation aspect of network coding, which is that uh, it also allows to virtualize the, the flow. So we, the, the flow packets, we can have a mathematical model for it. So, um, this makes network coding uh, be nat a natural uh, thing to integrate into virtualized frameworks of abstract entities, including the including not this framework, but also this uh, network uh, slice uh, thing, which I look forward so to listen to. So this is all. So for to be done from our perspective is of course more detailed descriptions, but this is just uh, let's say easy. What is uh, uh, challenging now and, and interesting is the, the conceptual matching, and then detailed examples because uh, to demonstrate what is this useful for you for, and and then also the connection to other virtualized uh, concepts like this. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Angela. So, Questions? Sorry. Uh, Questions? <laughs> <laughs> who, who else read this draft? Okay. Um, so I had a question. Um, do you have any, you know, driving applications? What is what is um, the main idea? I mean, is it improving reliability, or, um, or do you have any, like other, like, say, higher layer application requirements? Yeah, we um, 
it depends on which uh, in which part of the network you are but from the inner network for as far as i see there is they uh, it seems that in order to fix uh, failures and reliability problems there is over provisioning what is uh, what is used so then this is a solution for that right for example so you are <coughs> investigating different use cases? Yes, mm. Mm. but uh, I think here may, this might uh, sound better, <laughs> this uh, inner core uh, over-provisioning problem. Okay, okay. So, mm. No, microphone. So uh, next time, if, if you bring this back in, I, I think calling on a couple of the use cases that you're yes. thinking of would be really helpful. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this is more a clarification question. Uh, the scope of your work is contained in a VNF. Is that what you're proposing? Or is outside the VNF? Diego's at the... It's, uh, it uses VNF. It uses it. You define a new VNF. Uh, mm. It def I define a new VNF, but also a new, a different understanding of the of the framework. No, no. Um, that, that, I'm sorry, we are over time, and we'll have to take that question to the list. Uh, behind you, you can come up. Diego's next, though. He was in. Okay. No, no, please. You have two Thank questions. You, no, no. Diego, well, so we already please. Admitted don't, you. don't run away, Angeles, please. <laughs> Uh, no, it's uh, it's simply to, a, a couple of things. One is that uh, Simon Pietro Romano, who's one of the uh, people in the, in the Miteco team, uh, was saying that they were uh, supporting, or they, they were willing to support this draft because they, they see use cases for it, just uh, as a note. So the people that are enabling me to, to be uh, interacting with you is uh, are happy with this idea. Uh, mostly because they are thinking about satellite scenarios. I, I was thinking something that came to my mind is in many, many, many um, um, <clears throat> scenarios I have seen about uh, VNF deployments. One of the ways in which people uh, proposes to guarantee a certain degree of uh, of uh, mobility of the uh, of the VNFs is precisely by using load balancers. Uh, because everybody think about the load balancer being aware of the different instances of the VNFs and, and repart uh, um, and, and, and scheduling or well, delivering uh, the uh, packets to each one of the VNFs. I was wondering whether in this case we could think about one of the pot potential applications of network coding would be precisely to substitute these uh, uh, need for a, for a load balancer by uh, this kind of um, a coding network function that you that, that you have presented because it would be it maybe it would be a real architectural advantage yes i i think so it's um it is a quite advanced use of uh, network coding yes it's, uh, it requires to, as I was saying here, to virtualize the flows to get what the the, the uh, properties of every flow uh, have, and then with the, um, having access to the statistics and the the, the design uh, objectives you look for for each of the flows, then you uh, balance uh, with the with the uh, relative redundancy of the different flows. Yeah, f f following the suggestion from Sarah about the uh, about the use cases, uh, I would be more than happy if we can, you know, discuss this a little bit uh, in more detail and probably come to uh, Chicago with uh, some uh, discussion of a use case precisely about uh, load balancing. I'd love to. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. you had a question? Uh, hi, I'm Kyle Rose, uh, Sandvine. Um, I guess I'm just trying to struggle. I'm struggling with with what needs to change with the sort of architecture to fit this into it is it that there's concepts uh, understandings of the uh, the functions that need to be told to orchestrators to the infrastructure managers that aren't being like sent with the current protocols current uh, data models is that what we're trying to get at with the draft or are we just trying to say that hey here's, here's a cool thing that can fit into network function virtualization. Mm. 
didn't get exactly what is the the, the question. Um, are are you with, with the draft? Are you trying to suggest extensions or changes to um, the sort of current standards for uh, NFV, or are you just informing people of a new use of it? Yeah, the uh, in, uh, I, in my opinion, if the the concept is is uh, seen useful, then some of the blocks and of the functionalities that are in the framework needs to be sort of uh, not I don't know modified or extended or something. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks again. Yeah. Okay. So this um, concludes the like. Um, set of presentations on, on drafts we had. Now we are moving uh, to the section where we talk about, uh, you know, um, research projects, uh, open source activities, um, and so on. And, yes, please. Can we find the blue sheets and make sure yeah. those are being signed by everybody who's coming in? Can we circle those around again, please? Where are the blue sheets right now? in the back. Would you mind handing those in the back row and we'll start making their way forward? Thank you, sir. Okay, so next speaker oh. is Pedro and he talks about automated resource control in virtualized network environments. Okay, uh, I am just uh, presenting the uh, initial idea to gather uh, challenges for for especially network function virtualization and first i i this uh, this is regarding the automated uh, as the title says automated resource control in of course virtualized uh, uh, network environments and i start with the uh, with the typical uh, layered uh, infrastructure we we know, uh, where we have the the customers or clients uh, that are pushing uh, requirements, but also they can uh, push other thing, or, or other kind of, uh, of events in this case or incidents and things like that. But we also and, and then uh, <clears throat> they are pushed to one controller that is the what we have uh, called and in many places it's called the virtual resource controller that is within the virtual network operator in this case and that uh, entity has to uh, deal with the underlying uh, infrastructure through of course infrastructure providers and it requires to to use some kind of uh, interfaces Okay, but uh, those interfaces today are difficult to be standardized. And but in general, what we have uh, put more attention is that uh, even though uh, st a standardization of interfaces may be not uh, strictly necessary because we can use some kind of adapters, it is important that they uh, are uh, offering the same functions. So uh, what we have called uh, idempotency. So they are not idempotent. So the the virtual network operator cannot relay on different providers, different uh, systems in the uh, infrastructure la layer, uh, without uh, having uh, reduced uh, functions in one provider that other providers can uh, are offering. Okay, so here we state the challenges. That is to be uh, to to get some common uh, set of uh, functions that uh, underlying providers must use, and if possible, they uh, of course provide them uh, through a, a more or less uh, standardized or uh, well-known API. I have uh, included some examples for Open Daylight or Open Stack using the uh, REST uh, interfaces. But apart from that, from that uh, we also have uh, identified that uh, the notification of the state of allowed, uh, uh, allocated resources in the underlying infrastructures is not well covered in the different uh, uh, 
proposals for for the provision of resources so uh, you know pulling the rest interface is not a good approach so a push uh, approach should be used and uh, we encourage to include some kind uh, of uh, of a notification approach in the underlying and also this kind of notification should be more or less common so the virtual network operators can uh, interact with different providers uh, using the same uh, expecting the same um, in this case concepts uh, notification concepts and finally in order to ensure that all of this is uh, is is more or less uh, common in in different uh, working uh, in this case in IATF working groups of or even research uh, uh, areas we propose to to we we found the challenge in this case no uh, to to establish a common ontology a set of concepts and relations between them that can be mapped to different uh, uh, architectures or different uh, solutions that is regarding the, the, the resource allocation, but uh, we have also uh, identified some challenges regarding the support for machine-to-machine uh, -machine communications, and especially the Internet of Things. And in addition to what uh, I have just mentioned, we also uh, identified that uh, in some uh, circumstances, uh, IoT objects, and devices uh, they, that are building their own uh, ad hoc networks, for instance, they can uh, need to relay some of their uh, functions to infrastructure, to cloud. And uh, some of those that infra, uh, functions should be located, location dependent. So uh, we have a, a uh, <clears throat> well, so this can be provided what, uh, from, uh, by what uh, it was called the fog nodes. So in, from, to accomplish this uh, scenario, we have uh, also identified the, the need to uh, provide uh, some kind of locomotion semantics through the interfaces for, for, the, <clears throat> for the infrastructure providers. So, like for example, uh, specifying that uh, a set of things or even an individual thing requires some kind of uh, uh, computing node uh, in the location that uh, the thing resides, so as close as possible, because of uh, different things uh, that are uh, interacting to each other require that um, computing power close to them. And also, uh, they have to, in this case of the computing, but they have to reference the same uh, element uh, uh, regarding also location-based uh, to, to the network resources, like, uh, for example, to link those computing nodes to the things themselves. So this uh, requires the IMP, the infrastructure providers, to expose also, uh, apart from cloud, also fog resources. Uh, with little hassle for consumers, I would say, uh, and, um, <clears throat> and in general, this requires mechanisms to interconnect data planes of things with uh, cloud uh, and NFB providers in general. That's all from, from my side. Just uh, the very initial uh, work in this sense, and we wanted to discuss with you the the main uh, challenges we have identified uh, up, up to now. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Pinto. Do people have questions? How many folks have read the draft? Uh, there's some draft. Um, what are the next steps for, for you in this work? Do, Oh, our next steps actually are uh, we are working in the uh, uh, virtual resource controller itself. So our, our next steps would be to find uh, some kind of uh, set of functions that uh, such virtual resource controller requires from lower layers that are not currently provided by uh, already existing solutions. Mm. Uh, regard, this is regarding the NFB, especially the NFB RT. So uh, that, to gather that set of uh, functions and 
uh, expose them to the NFB RG uh, mm. team. Mm. Um, so are you implementing that uh, on some platform or is that too Yeah, we, we are actually in the very early <laughs> research phase, but we we are intending to implement some that, that uh, virtual resource controller uh, mm, let's say mechanisms or system or whatever you say. Okay. Cool. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Being at benchmarking. Yeah. Okay. Rafael. Okay. Uh, so uh, this work is about um, a VNF uh, testing framework. It's a prototype, going on ongoing prototype. Uh, in partnership with my advisor, Christian Rotenberg from the University of Campinas, and my colleague of research, Robert Sabo, in Ericsson Research Hungary. So uh, it's it's based on previous works presented in NFERG and uh, BM.G. Um, so I'm going to talk about the design implementation and some partial results that we have. Basically, we know we all know that VNFs are like software components that can be instantiated in different virtualized environments. Uh, this comes from the Etsy and FV architectural framework. And that uh, these virtualized uh, environments can, can be different, can be heterogeneous, can have different capabilities to offer to the VNF, uh, accelerators and different uh, platforms. Uh, and we also know that uh, not only the, the, the environment can change, but also the VNF itself can change thinking about the, the VNF developer perspective in a continuous integration that VNF can change really fast and be deployed in different environments itself. So uh, in this case, we believe that VNF descriptors in the, in the sense of the Etsy definition can define also some performance profiles uh, associating, for example, metrics of network like throughput with uh, the allocated resource, for example, the virtual CPU. And uh, based on this, we proposed initially in the NFVRGs uh, uh, a draft some time ago that is expired. We are under review now. This uh, initial proposal called a VBAS. It's a VNF benchmarking as a service. Initially, it's a standalone framework that uh, have an interface to service with the NFVO and, uh, and the VNF developers to define this idea of uh, uh, contact with some certain definitions of VNF benchmarking profiles. That means the developers sp specify how the VNF needs to be benchmarked, associating the, the possible metrics with the resource allocated. And in return, with the deployment of these profiles and this benchmarking of this extraction of metrics in different environments, we believe that we can have an, uh, an automated process to extract these metrics and obtain certain parameters associated with performance versus the, the relocated resource. So just to go through like a quick example of the a simple workflow that could happen. For example, suppose that a customer would like to allocate certain VNFs uh, and then FVO would like to know the resource available uh, compatible with those VNFs to be deployed. So the VBAS itself could be like a, a standalone interface for the NFVO that could uh, reach for the, the VNF uh, benchmarking profile to be deployed. It could be deployed, the VNF benchmarking profile. This VNF benchmarking profile com is composed of uh, managers, some agents, and monitors to deploy the, the, the decomposition of elements that can extract these metrics from the VNF. These metrics can be defined back to the VBAS via an interface, internal interface of the components. And they start in a in a in a interf uh, information database of the VNF profiles that could compose the VNF descriptors, and in this case, the NFVO could reach these uh, profiles and uh, have a, a a definition of the possible metrics that uh, the, the resource that it, it needs to locate to reach certain uh, metrics in the network, and um, so. So basically, the, the, the framework itself consists of the, the implementation of the framework consists of this orange, these elements in orange here, plus some agents and monitors. 
I'm going to speak about it. So basically what it has like uh, is a definition of the NFO composing like a NFFG or a VNFFG with certain parameters to deploy a VNF in certain uh, virtualized environment. In return, the, the system itself returns the, the, this v, uh, VNF benchmarking profile with the VNFG of the, the resource that needs to be allocated and deployed in the, in the virtualized environment. And then the whole process goes on. So what was prototyped in this case? It was this interaction of the system here, the, the main core of the system, the interface with the NFBO. Um, these in these components of the, the also the, the benchmarking information base and the VNF profiles information base, all together with the, the agents, the monitors. I'm going to speak about it. And these are the main interactions of the main core system with the NFBO that uh, requests the deployment of a VNFG. From here, we see that uh, we have the VNF benchmarking profile information base that is like description of how the VNS can be benchmarked. And here we see that the, the, there's like a parameter of con configurability of it that this defines that these procedures can be repeatable. Uh, also, with the extraction of the tests and the, the extraction of the metrics using these components, the manager and agency agents and monitors to probe the VNF itself you have the test itself uh, that the extraction of the metrics uh, and this this way that the metrics can be extracted and saved in a vnf uh, information base with vnf uh, profiles and uh, these these uh, tests these results can be validated uh, in different scenarios in different uh, composition of in different VN, for different vnfs itself and then if you can reach them so this is just a, a, a model of information of the establishment of the components and the, the information models that they exchange among themselves. I'm not going through this, these components because uh, it's like extensive definition, but basically it's just from the, 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 the main system, you can go down from the manager to the, the agents and the monitors and the probers themselves. The probers are the, 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 the the interface to the tools that you can extract the metrics and the way back and composing this all these information models. Uh, so this is a, just a, a, an example of a, a metric. It's a, one of the messages, an instruction that the manager can send to the agents, for example, in this case for a pink uh, prober. And this is, for example, an example of, uh, of a result of the instruction that we call it snapshot. Um, this is uh, simple examples of it. And uh, so all of this was prototyped. This, the main core of this VBAS, these agents and these monitors and the manager. Uh, it means that all these components are independent or they're, they're all coded in Python. Um, each of them is like, like defined by microservice. Like each one is like a, a, a pluggable component and uh, they're like standalone. Uh, they have standalone REST APIs. They are totally independent from each other. In the agents and the monitors, we have pluggable probers and listeners. Probers and listeners, in this case, are the elements that make the interface with new tools. For example, ping, iperf, package gen. So it's easy to attach and install and load these new tools using these this, uh, probers and listeners in agents and monitors. And there are simple workflows of interaction among these components. Uh, using JSON RPC. So we are looking into three uh, use case in uh, in the prototype now uh, that we're long to, to test it. So first is a software switch. We target like layer two traffic, simple traffic via package gen, for example, iperf. And uh, the second one is a VIMS. We target to, we are we're targeting like the decomposite components in uh, containers and VM, VMs, virtual machines to see how we can get the metrics in a distributed way. And uh, the third one is like, uh, we, we have a layer four, layer seven custom VNF that we are trying to see from the perspective of the VNF de developer to see internal instrumentation, how it can help in the definition of these profiles. Uh, we know there are related work, uh, OPNF VR stick and uh, this uh, is a platform in Go language now for testing distributed environments. Uh, we can integrate the components here with these two environments uh, via the REST APIs. We believe that. And um, 
our related work associated with ITF, RFCs, and IRTF as well in drafts, uh, we are considering all the, the, the definitions of the benchmarking methodology for network inter interconnected device, the RFC. Uh, 2544. We are also considering the definition of the IP performance metrics framework, all the, the considerations of the metrics, composition of metrics in RFC 2330. Uh, of course, we are considering the BMWG draft on VNF benchmarking methodology considerations. Uh, we initially uh, even proposed some work. We are considering the this benchmarking of virtual switches in OpenFV as well, this draft for our prototyping and our use case analysis. And our initial work proposal was a draft on, VN, on VNF benchmarking methodology that it's expired actually. We thought initially that it was too soon to propose this in the BMWG. So our approach now is more pragmatic. We are going to show the experimental results first and then maybe come back and show the results and talk to, to the guys about the possible standardizations. With the NFVRG, we see the intersection in two fields of the, the, the charter and the VNF performance in modeling. That uh, somehow to define this VNF benchmarking profiles, we see that uh, we need to gain from it, we need to gain information on how to extract the VNF performance metrics. And this way of getting this knowledge of how to extract these metrics, you're actually discovering how you can mod model the, the performance of a VNF. We believe so. And we also see that, of course, when you extract these metrics of VNF profiles, you can define analytics for visibility and orchestration. It's like uh, how the NFV would like to have this, these metrics associated with the resource allocation for possible allocation of VNFs in different uh, ops or different virtualizing environments. So what is done is the prototype of this uh, on this initial VBAS proposal. Uh, we, we see this as a input for experiments and assist the possible standardization in the future. We are doing this test in the use case now. The next steps, we are going for academic publication, as I said. We are going to show the results, show the framework, the, the architecture, the definition of the messages, the interconnection and everything. We for sure plan to open source this, not only open source. We believe that uh, uh, open sourcing this tool as well contributes to the way of generate, uh, creating these VNF uh, profiles. I mean, you could run as a VNF developer and uh, create a repository of VNF profiles that people could interact to and make like big data analytics on top of it. Um, and possibly with these results and everything and the discussion, we can go back to BMWG or an IRTF and an FVRG and go back to the VNF benchmarking methodology definitions. So that's the work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep, there are questions. Thank you for an interesting talk. And uh, is this too who, for the- who, who are you? Oh, Kohei Shiamoto, NTT. Thank you. And uh, is this tool for the in-service testing or uh, test for the development stage? Sorry, could you oh. repeat the question, please? Is this tool for the in-service testing or test for the development stage for the? Okay, uh, th th this is an interesting topic and I think it's included in the, in the research of the use cases because um, uh, there's like the, the two definitions of how you can extract these metrics. If you actually define the behavior of the service and you can extract then the, 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 the metrics of the VNF, or if you can extract the, the performance of the VNF itself without considering the behavior of the service. Or we, we are considering here that the, 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 the tool itself can provide the means to you for you can add, for example, in the case for the VIMS, we have the CP, like a, 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 a tool for benchmarking the, the, the VIMS. And it's specific for the VMS for for the VNF itself, and this tool is like um, has all the behaviors of how to reproduce the service itself, and it's attachable to the, the platform using the uh, proper definition, and then you have the definition of the service. So we, we believe that this VNF is specific, uh, call it like VNF is specific benchmarking in service, like as you refer to, it's possible to be made using this tool. Or you can just make also the bit, the, the benchmark using like uh, the VNF itself, the, the the traffic, and without considering the whole service 
or like a state machine definition of. Thank you. Uh, so John from SKKU, uh, I think this is very interesting job, and uh, but one question is that uh, actually uh, I distinguish this benchmarking and the performance monitoring. And uh, meaning that the performance monitoring that more in that in the running operation perspective. So, but looking at this something like you know the interaction between VVS and the NFE or, but can also you are thinking that uh, these benchmarking services can be used for performance monitoring in the learning operation, or not? Yeah, I mean we we said initially actually that the name of the tool actually changed now. It's actually a, a VNF testing uh, platform because uh, you see benchmarking is one, one of the approach of, of testing and uh, benchmarking validation and and, uh, and dimensioning could be all like uh, coexist depending on the how the parameters that you're playing with in the in the contact of the of the NFVO. For example, uh, in the case of dimension, you'd like to see how many resources you'd like to locate to reach certain throughput. And and this in this case could be the platform also could be used for that, and this is a case for a monitoring perspective. For example, you would like to monitor the CPU and allocate certain CPU at certain levels, and the platform could be used for that too. Okay, uh, regarding that, your prototyping that some you are using any open source for HJ model or you are developing on the, your own this model. My own, sorry. Manual management and orchestration, for example. I mean, how how you gonna prototype this whole this you know this module and whole this system architecture? For example, there was the model, right? NFVO. Yes. And the VVS will interact with this model, right? Yes. And for this model, that what open source? Oh, okay, know? okay. The NFVO part. Oh, I I worked in a, in a previous project called Unify, so we have a kind of like a developer, my own. NFO that I can develop, that can instantiate uh, uh, containers and everything. It's a part of a unified project that it was also presented in this. I, so I defined my own orchestrator. Possibly a, it's an, another moment can be out, also open sourced. And uh, I'm using that interface, my, my own interface for, for experiments only. In the future, maybe it can be out, open sourced. Okay, thanks, Sophia. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next is uh, Tayo Heum, Duncan Duncan, Optimal Service Placement using pseudo service training mechanism. Okay, hello, my name is Tayo Na. I'm working on working for Network Software Platform Research section in Atri. The title of my presentation is Optimal Service Placement Using Pseudo Service Chaining Mechanism. It is came from Plane and Mano, which is the one of the project in Atri. It is funded by Korean government. This is the content of my presentation. Before I explain my mechanism, I need to introduce my, our plan and manual as a background. And, and then I will explain the placement mechanism. It is consisted of three of page, and I will conclude my presentation. The definition of plan and manual is playground for the virtualized network application. It is built it based on open source model. And this is the reference model. Our virtualized infrastructure manager is consists of OpenStack and additional functionality. And it supports uh, two type of virtualization, which are virtual machine and container. And we implement additional link API to support point-to-point -point type of link. Because OpenStack only supports multi-point to multi-point. Oh, sorry. And we support 
GUI for the user convenience. This is the main page of the our UI. Uh, there are a lot of icon. Uh, this is the list of the VNF installed the VNF, and this is the uh, list of the network service. And user can handle their VNF through Play Store by clicking this icon. Then user can handle their VNF. User can install or uninstall, registering or unregistering their VNF. This is the uh, to register their VNF. You just have to fill in this format, the name of the VNF and version and software. They have to attach their software image and VNF description. Then this is a, a space for the producing their network service. Uh, there are three parts. Stencil, left side is Stencil. Uh, it is the um, installed VNF is located to the Stencil. And user, by drag, dragging and dropping this icon to the canvas, uh, user can instantiate the VNF. And then using those tools, you can make a link between among the VNF instance. And we support saving and loading network service through those, those button. And when network service is loaded, all of the VNF instance, all of the VNF instance in network services is starts to instantiate it and make a link and configuration of instance, VNF instance also synchronize it. At this situation, we need to consider about uh, placement for the network performance. Okay, in H standard, we find the two draft document. There are it already mentioned about trapping localization. I think our work can be the one of the huge case of trapping localization. And we use several HC model to handle our network service. We use a forwarding graph description to manage network service, saving or loading the network service. And we use a virtual link description and virtual link record. And we add additional parameter at virtual link description to to implement our mechanism. That is, that's our number of transaction and rate of transaction and amount of traffic. The goal of our mechanism is to get more better virtual performance of virtual link by localizing service function. Localizing service function means minimize the number of entity in service function pass. And we assume that it does not consider scaling or policy or available yet. This is the overall process of our mechanism. It is consists of three pages. Firstly, it try it calculate all of the link in the VNF wording graph and selecting pseudo virtual load. The virtual load means two or pseudo virtual load means uh, service node is connected to service node, which is by the link, which is have largest cost. And then we select the available computing node from all of the computing node, and then conduct, conduct placement. At the first page, we use three parameter, transaction, number of transaction, and weight of transaction, and volume of traffic at the link. We use this equation, and some parameter are lo lo normalized. 
to alleviate the high variance. And then you select pseudo virtual load. In page, page two, we selecting computing node. Mm, it filtering the computing node based on mm, resource requirement of service node. And it make a list of available computing node. It means, it means computing node have enough resource to accommodate more service node. If it is not enough to accommodate network service, then we change it to the filtering value to minimum resource requirement in the service node. And we sort the net list of available computing node in descending order. At the page three, we conduct grid placement because uh, it is similar to the multiple AppSec problem. So available computing node can be the NAPSEC and item service node or pseudo virtual load can be the item. And cost can be the list represent to value of item. This is the figure, this figure show the process at the page three. Left side is the initial state of page three. So the virtual load and available computing node is already selected and, and then at, at this time, it compare available resource with resource requirement of so the virtual load. If available resource is larger than resource requirement, then it update when the forwarding graph like this and go to the page one to, to select new pseudo virtual load. <coughs> At the time, in this figure, service node one is included to pseudo virtual load because T1 is larger than T3, it is cost. And it go to the page three and compare with resource requirement with available resource. If it is smaller than resource requirement, it go back to the previous state and con conduct placement to pseudo virtual load. After then it updates when a forwarding graph and resource, available resource, and then it recursively conduct the mechanism. It go to, going to the page one. This is the last, last slide of my presentation. We, we apply this mechanism, our, our platform, our Mano platform. It improve 40% of round trip time and it improve 37% of UDP risk rate. And <clears throat> it shows a better performance for the loss rate of UDP packet and decrease round trip time and less CPU usage of the host node. Okay. And because our work is, we submit paper about our work, it is on the review. Mm. So I didn't include any, some detail in my presentation. Right. I'm afraid. But if people have questions, you can probably answer. Sorry? If people have questions, you can probably answer them. I think if you send me the email, that is probably. Well, we have one question. Do we have time here? Oh, okay. My, my, microphone. Mm. Sorry. There's a lot of remote attendees. Thank you. Uh, Andy Veach, uh, the quick question is under review by whom or do you anticipate this being published soon? Sorry? Is, is the paper going to be available or even in pre, pre-release pre form? Uh, not yet. It is under review. I think maybe after one month, I think it is free. 
Okay. Yeah, thanks for bringing that work to NFVRG. Um, are there more questions? So I just I just want to make one slightly pedantic comment. Um, so don't take it personally. So um, we have to be careful. I mean, when we talk about standardization, right? So here in the IRTF, we are normally not doing standards. Mm -hmm. So this is a, as a research group. We may be doing specifications, so like for experimentation and so on, but they're not on the standards track of the IETF. Wow. And, and this kind of um, keeps creeping in, and um, so it's kind of important to clarify that. But it's, um, you're not the first one. <laughs> <laughs> OK, sorry for that. Um, thank you very much. OK, um, so next will be Hanu, I think, with an overview about uh, mobile edge computing. You have some time. You also have a lot of slides. So. Yes, but I, I still try to keep it within 20 minutes. You're saying we are ahead, so no worries. OK, good, good. OK, hello, everybody. I'm, I'm Hanno Flink, and I'm presenting this on behalf of Nuritz Perehel. She was originally scheduled to give the presentation. I need to start this uh, with a disclaimer. I think this is disclaimer is required by Etsy. So I present this Etsy work and status, <laughs> but I do not represent Etsy by doing this. So this is the legal. Thanks for the clarification. Art. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, does it work? All right, so mobile edge computing. This has been a very popular topic. I, I think you, most of you have heard it. Everybody has probably heard it. The concept here is that, that we bring cloud computing and IT resources at, at the edge as close as possible to the end user. And, and fr from this fact, you, you can notice the characteristics of, of this of mobile edge computing. It is a proximity to the place where the consumer of the service is located. It provides low late, ultra low latency because it is skipping the backhaul communication and, and it doesn't need to have a round trip time to the centralized node, but, but we have computing resources next to the access point. It provides also high bandwidth and, and that's because it has the visibility of the radio access and, and can leverage the radio in a most efficient way. And, and also the context information that, that we have from the subscriber and the device and also, it's a location aware, of course, because we are bringing the service as close to the user as possible. So these are the primary characteristics of it. The selling points of mobile edge computing are listed here, starting from the much improved quality of experience, again, based on the proximity and, 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 the, and the bandwidth and, and latency that, that it provides. The, it also supports um, context-aware services. Services can be tailored to certain specific location, user, and other preferences. And it has possibility to use radio resources and other network res re resources efficiently. Especially this, this radio has been the driving force here, having the radio information server close to it. And if you, you combine those, it is expected that we are able to create new type of services which have not been possible un until now, leveraging real-timeness, interactivity, providing analytic services at, at the boundary of the network at the edge, security and privacy le leveraging again this local information, and then it's distributed nature. In terms of foreseen business benefits, probably the main point here is that, that it encourages new type of collaboration, it's creating new value chain, collaboration between the infrastructure provider, meaning the operator who is providing the access points, service providers, OTT providers, and application providers. Uh, by doing this, it, it's part of the business transformation, it targets new market segments, those that were not feasible in, in the earlier 
uh, earlier approaches, namely new enterprise type of services, verticals, and, and also to subscribers. Uh, we have, Etsy had created, and, and also we as a company, a number of uh, proof of concepts, and it, these are examples of the new use cases and applications that, that it's providing, video acceleration, augmented reality, connected vehicles, IoT analytics, and so forth. Etsy Mobile X Computing uh, Industry Standardization Group was established 2014. Here are the primary companies behind this initiative. And the purpose of this industry standardization specification group is to create open and standardized IT service environment that is capable to hosting these third party applications at the edge of the network, but still being compliant with, with the regulatory regulatory and legal requirements that are stemming from the fact that this is operator services and, and accessing radio capacity. So it, it some, somewhat re regulated environment to start with. So it, it's formed under the auspices of uh, Etsy, industry specification groups, and as already mentioned, it, it leverages this visibility to real-time radio status and context information and provides this new type of services and also value chains. Here are the current uh, members of the team. This is not necessarily the latest, so there are other companies who have joined there. You probably recognize your own logo there. Uh, interesting point here is that it needs to be emphasized is that it reflects this expected new value chain. Uh, so, so we have operators involved, vendors, network we equipment vendors, technology providers, uh, application and content providers. So it, it's uh, all the actors are actively looking into this and um, developing technology. So what does this uh, ISG do then? The primary thing are these normative group specifications. Uh, oh, oh. I need to go one back. Okay. <laughs> Two seven. Um, I think you keep pressing. Is it possible? <laughs> the one with the API. Anyway, anyway, so if you can help me. I try. So the pr primary product of this uh, ISG is uh, are these I APIs. API definitions. Okay, no. I you know what? Let, let me unplug the clicker and, uh, and help you. Do so. And maybe we start this one. You were at. It's seven, I guess. Number seven. Okay, so uh, good that I have time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks to the previous speakers. Uh, uh, yeah, good. All right. All right, so the, the, these computing platform APIs are, are the primary products and how they have divided, oops, and okay, how they have divided the work is, is that, that there is a platform part of it and then there is application, third party application part and, and then the APIs. Uh, this, this is the status of the current work. So far what they have developed is the technical requirements including use cases, framework and reference architecture terminology, proof of concepts, a number of those, uh, service scenarios, and, and then uh, a white paper that is showing how mobile X computing is uh, helping to materialize 5G networks. Uh, the work in progress at the moment, uh, they are re related to these, these mobile X computing APIs. You, you see there a li list, listing of the API, so, so there is API to access this radio information, location API, user identity, bandwidth management, and, and so forth. Uh, then what, they are, there is active work on integrating this uh, mobile edge computing with the NFW framework and environment, and, and then there, there are these supporting activities to accelerate, accelerate make solutions to the market. 
Okay, so, so the framework is pretty much leaning based on, on NFE infrastructure, especially the, the, the management part is, is something. Something magical okay. is happening. Is this an, an autoplay presentation? So okay. okay, all right. So and, and, and if we, is the yeah okay that that might be good that might at least so so the rough one and if it is taught to provide the management part of it key point here is that that there should be a common orchestrator that all these third party applications can be provisioned in in the very same way to the this standard make platform environment. The, the starting point was 3GPP compliance, so, so the, the reference points are inherited from there at the moment. And, and finally, it supports different types of deployment scenarios. The MEC server can be at the cell side, it can be on an accelerator ag 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 aggregation site, or, or then it can be in a cloud run. And, and finally, even in the centralized core network. Next, next slide, please. Here is a the current reference architecture which divides the system in the mobile system level, which deals with the provision and provides the customer facing interfaces, how the customer enterprise or even end user can provision services from the mobile edge. Then the lower part is the mobile edge host level, which deals with the ser computing capabilities at the edge, edge of the network. There is this mobile edge host, the biggest box there which, where we have these mobile edge applications. These are these third party why not operator services as well, which are then accessing the mobile edge platform. And all these interfaces are, are going to be defined. Uh, the relationship of, of the mobile edge computing to NFV work is, is complementary. Uh, NFV is, is virtualizing network functions and appliance-based solutions in, in the cloud-based solutions, whereas mobile edge computing is providing a, a execution environment for these third-party applications at the edge of the network. So it, it is MEC is reusing these uh, NFE functionalities, but the scope is, is different, focus and business-wise, different objectives. Next. Uh, it is a component uh, towards 5G. Uh, it complements a, a also SDN and in addition to NFE. So, and, and especially how it's doing this is that 5G has very stringent requirements for throughput and latency, and, and the latency solution is, is, is can only be met that, that we bring these services closer to the edge. And, and and if that is accepted, then mobile edge computing is the way to go. Then there are these other additional benefits related to QoE and, and total cost of ownership and business opportunities. Maybe we can go to the next one. Let's leave this one. This is okay. So here, here is a flavor for you, you to see what, what kind of proof of concepts have, have been developed by Etsy. So there are eight of those all together. I'm, I'm mm. only going two of them through. So now next, may I try? You take a time. Um, um, no, one. no, 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 if you go to the slide number 17. Okay. Okay. 17. 17, it's this, this one, yes. And why I want to bring this up is that this has been discussed in, in the IETF. So this is, this is the application of this mobile throughput guidance proposal, what we have, have had earlier and still working on it with a with number of other companies. The idea here is that, that, that there is this mobile edge computing server next to the e, e -node P and, and this mobile edge MEC server is hosting radio analytics application. And, and this radio analytics application is providing throughput guidance estimates or hints uh, to the video content server, which that is deeper in the network. The video content server is, is then able, based on these hints, 
control the TCP congestion window as well as uh, choose the most suitable application level coding that matches this estimated capacity of radio downlink. Uh, okay, so this has developed, we have presented the results of, of field trials of this and it's quite, quite pro promising solution. And next, next slide. Another example of how, how one can leverage this mobile edge computing. Here, the mobile edge server is a, is a road associated again in, in the base station, and it, it is acting as a roadside unit for vehicle to vehicle infrastructure. Uh, and, and here, what happens is that the application is able to recognize hazards and other problems on the road and then warn those cars who have proper equipment that there is some, some hassle ongoing. Uh, this has been developed uh, together with Deutsche Telekom and, and in close to Munich there is a motorway called A9 where, where this has been tested and, and in YouTube you can also see a video on this if you like. Okay and, and then uh, what what is next so so the first period was 2015 and 16 where the foundations and, and these reference architectures were defined and the use cases and box and and etsy directorate has approved next period next term for the work and and of course what's going to happen is that etsy is going to finalize the tales of the previous work and and moving forward to new use cases and extending the domain. The next slide then shows the <coughs> objectives for this release too. And, and here, if, if you look at the bottom, you, you notice that it's extending from mobile edge computing to multi-access edge computing. And this refers to the first box there and, and the left upper corner. So until so far, we, we have been looking at the three GPP cellular type of networks, but in, in the release to its extent, extended to non 3 gpp accesses, wireless LAN and fixed, fixed network also. Uh, also, other type of virtualization solutions will be considered and specified. There are these charging mod models that, that will be looked into. Uh, there's uh, these regula regulatory caps related to lawful inter interception and, and testing and these kind of supporting activities. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is concluding the presentation. So mobile edge computing is a key component in a building block in the evolution of mobile broadband networks and it complements NFV and SDN. It is identified as an enabler for new type of services, particularly IoT and mission critical vertical so solutions because of this, this proximity benefit that it gains. Uh, it, it is recognized to be a, a, a tool in, 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 in a element in, in, in 5G architecture. You can also start to deploy MEC type of solutions in, in 4G. And, and take the benefit, benefit there of using these new services also in, in 14 networks. Uh, and finally, it is expected to enable new type of applications and related business opportunities. It's entering the release two phase in, in Etsy. So that, that's the presentation. Thank you, Hanu. So we have time for some questions. So I'm the Kutcher. Um, I mean, so in the in the ITF in the transport area, so latency reduction is also currently a like um, active topic. And so I think essentially what what people um, noticed is that I mean, uh, in 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 reality, I say most or not or all all applications actually benefit from low latency, right? So not only sure. interactive real time, but also you know, web web traffic um, and so on. 
And so, I mean, there is this, you know, there are like activities on like low latency, um, so like data center TCP um, like approaches. Then we have started this new work on Quick. Yeah, so assuming this all you know gets implemented and so on. Um, so what are the use cases that are left for MEC uh, to to optimize latency or to use latency further? Well, well, even if using Quick or or these are other more optimized transport protocols. It, it doesn't, those do not resolve the issue of, of distance. So, so still the distance is a factor because the signal cannot travel faster than the light of speed. So mobile edge computing is doing, what is doing it is keeping a order of hundreds of milliseconds in average case bringing these critical applications close to the edge. Mm. So actually, this work so far hasn't taken any position on, on these improved transport protocols at, at all. It's, well, what, what is leveraging is, is more of the locality of the services, the base station. Well, I have no water phone. So with low latency, we want to have in 5G networks, this is not only related. Uh, to the fact that we have something closer to the customer, which you're calling edge. Uh, in LTE, we have a technical limit of about uh, 20 milliseconds uh, between user equipment and the radio yes. on Mac layer. Yeah. And on 5G, we want to bring this down with better silicon to roughly, we say, one millisecond. Okay, yes. Let's see, that, that is, I, I, I it's that. not the edge, uh, it's basically the silicon. And when you say we say uh, 20 milliseconds, it's a lot of thousand kilometers, and you have two, 200 kilometers per millisecond. Yeah? yeah. So it's a new silicon which basically takes care of this low, lower latency in radio networks. It's not the edge is well, also a component, but not the most important one. Okay, that, that that's true. So so you are saying that the radio is. Radio is adding the deal, and, and it's true that yeah. 5G radio is yeah. supposed you, to solve that. You, you never would make this low latency stuff, this tactile stuff, and so on. We described uh, some years ago with 4G. Yep, correct. That's true. Okay, let's see other questions. Let me ask one more. Um, so you, you had this one uh, use case that we also discussed in the ITF with the uh, mobile throughput guidance. Yes. I mean, is this an advisable model where you, I mean, basically you have to make the application server, the video server, for example, aware of what's going on in the base station? Is that something we want to have? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have been involved in th that work, so I, I have to advocate. Yes, it is. Yeah, okay, sorry. It's very sorry for putting you advisable. <laughs> Actually, the draft carries my, my name also there. So, But, but yeah, yes, that, that, that's the... If you want to react to something which is happening in a very short time frame, it, the current TCP windowing is, is not able to support that. You, and especially if you are anticipating something to happen. Anticipating happens to something that, that this radio is a shared resource amongst many. So the single TCP session is in congestion control cannot tell you as much what, what the access point or, or the base station can see. Okay. Then, it's, then it's a question of that, how many, how many percentage that this improvement is. But what we have seen and what, what, what seen and, and tested and reported here in IETF, the improvement is significant. We, we are talking about 30 to 50 percent improvement mm. by leveraging this, let's say, metadata. And, okay, then one fun final, if I may. Yes. Um, so we mentioned at the next step um, the multi-access mobile uh, Yes. Thing. So uh, is this basically just um, about, you know, enabling MEC in like non-CPP networks, or is that also about um, so when you have like hybrid access or you have like soft handover or multi-pass access to have some like synchronization between the edge computing platforms, or could this be an issue if you don't have it? Uh, 
now this is of, of my best knowledge okay. right? so it, it, it's it's not that that as this network is, is do, doing so the latter one is is 5g networks that, that they are inherently going to be multi-access support mm -hmm. at, at very low level it is what they're they're looking into so, so it is pdc layer or maybe about but, but this mech, mech solution is it gives you quick start in multi-access so so that you can also integrate these uh, IP level and other access, fixed accesses in, into the equation without this lower level support. All right. So, thank you. So this, sorry. this concludes the, um, the set of scheduled presentations. Um, so since you all are very disciplined in thanking, uh, we have some some time left for any announcements, uh, news that people want to share. So I think Alex had, had some news. Is he still around? He, he wants to do it on the list. Okay, Alex will do it on the list. Where's the other blue sheet? There's one more floating around the room somewhere. Okay. Okay, we will see. <laughs> I guess we'll find that. We'll find that. Thanks for coming. Have a nice evening. See you next time. Please. But you if you haven't signed, now's the chance. Man, we finished.